Welcome, everyone. My name is Shana Steele. I'm the general manager at Rise created by Barclays, uh, and I manage the New York site. Thank you for joining us today for this uh, special event uh, of Rise Presents, uh, taking up space, women in their presence in fintech. Um, the discussion today um, will uh, cover topics um, such as uh, raising funds, uh, being a woman in fintech, uh, challenges and other lessons learned um, while being a, a woman and a leader uh, in fintech. And we're so excited to have uh, this panel and our um, moderator for this event. Uh, I'm now going to introduce uh, Alexander George, who is the Assistant Vice President, FinTech Platform Manager at Barclays Ventures. I work very closely with her here in New York, and she's going to share a bit about our site, Rise, and what we do here with you. Thanks again for joining us. Thanks so much, Shana, and thank you for that introduction, and thank you to everybody in attendance and the panelists, and I think this will be a really great discussion, and it's really great to be bringing in such inspiring females um, for the discussion today. Um, as Shana mentioned, my name is Alexandra George. I'm FinTech Platform Manager for Barclays Ventures. Uh, Barclays Ventures' mission is to deliver new propositions and experiences to address the needs of existing and new customers. Um, today's event about taking up space, women and their presence in fintech is being hosted by RISE, created by Barclays, which is Barclays' global fintech and innovation hub. RISE is a global community that is home to over 175 fintech companies. We work closely with the fintech startups at all stages of their life cycle to understand their value propositions and support them through programming, our partnerships, including the Barclays Accelerator, powered by Techstars, and the Female Innovators Lab by Barclays and Anthemis, and through enterprise engagement opportunities with Barclays. We like to say that we are creating the future of financial services by connecting, creating, and scaling with these fintechs, and for this reason, we are the home of fintech. Um, again, thank you all to all of the inspiring female panelists involved today and for everyone in attendance. Um, I'm very pleased to be passing it on to Marikit Corcoran, who is the head of Barclays Ventures US and will be today's moderator. Thank you so much. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Shana. Couldn't be more excited and privileged to be moderating this event today. We've got an incredible lineup of some of the hardest working, successful, and strongest women in the industry. So a bit of background, as Alex mentioned, I have the privilege of leading the Global Rise FinTech platform and leading up the innovation efforts across Barclays. Barclays is an 85,000 plus person uh, transatlantic bank with uh, people around the world. And we've truly understood the need to understand, partner and work with the fintechs around the world and all of the emerging startups that are really changing the future of financial services. A bit of background, I've been in the industry for about 20 years. Um, I joined, I started the industry in uh, 2000 during the internet boom. And uh, wow, things have changed. But uh, one thing that has not changed is I'm usually one of the few women in the room, whether that was in banking, finance, or technology. Unfortunately, in two decades, that has not changed very much. But what has changed has been my understanding of how to make sure I position myself appropriately in the market. And really what has changed as well is the networks that I've been able to build. And I think that's really key. Um, look, we have a long way to go to, you know, to having 50-50 gender equality in the workplace. But what you can do is really seek out the networks because as shown by this panel and the number of people who are joining this call, there are a lot of women in the industry who you can learn from, network with, partner with, and, and really um, progress your personal um, success as well as your, your team successes um, by working with them. A uh, couple of interesting facts just to highlight, um, you know, the these stats will differ based on which study you read, but uh, a study from Innovate Finance's 2019 Venture Capital Investment Report shows that female founders made up only 17% of the fintech companies um, currently today, and women only receive about 3% of VC funding. 3%, I mean, really let that sink in. And there's already a $300 billion uh, deficit in funding for small businesses owned by women. And unfortunately, that's only expected to grow with the economic fallout caused by COVID-19. And so that's part of what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, with that, I will um, have my panelists introduce themselves for ease of flow. I'm gonna have them do it by alphabetical order based on first name. So we can kick it off with Jen. Jen Byrne, please. Thanks, Merikit. Um, and thanks to the RISE and Barclays teams. You are all fantastic and it's been great to partner with you over the last several years. 
I'm Jen Byrne. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Kesne, and we run global innovation accelerators, competitions, and strategic sourcing projects uh, within fintech and insurtech. Uh, publicly, we're probably most known for our program that we've been running since 2017. Uh, female founders in fintech, female founders in insurtech, and most recently we added mobility. And we, we set those accelerators up to really bridge this gap between mentorship, access, funding, and um, support of very talented women-led uh, startups. And prior to Kesne, I uh, had a good run in corporate at American Express and Verizon, and was also at a handful of startups, and I am an active angel investor, mentor, and advisor. Look forward to the discussion with all of you fantastic women. Thanks, Jen. Hi, I'm Katie Palenchar. Uh, I'm an investor with Anthemis Group, uh, an early stage venture firm um, in New York City and London. I currently lead the Female Innovators Lab in partnership with Barclays, um, an early stage fund investing in pre-seed female founders, as well as supporting with a venture studio. Uh, excited to be here today. And my background, I'm coming to this from a founder perspective as well, a uh, former um, founder exited my company in 2017. Um, and uh, as it relates to all of these people on the panel today, I'm uh, super excited to talk about how all parts of the ecosystem plug into this. Great. Hi, everyone. My name is Sasha Pilch. I am the new business lead at a corporate card fintech called Ramp where challenging legacy providers like American Express by offering much more than just a way to pay, but also a way to strengthen your finance team's financial performance. Um, in addition to that, I'm also co-founder of NYC FinTech Women, an organization of 6,000 members with the mission to connect, promote, and empower women in order to advance their careers in FinTech. Um, we host monthly events, we have a lot of content across social media and do all that we can to promote women helping each other. Um, previous to this, I worked for large banks such as Citibank and Royal Bank of Scotland in London and I'm Australian, so the big banks in Australia, Westpac and Commonwealth Bank. Hi, uh, hello everyone. Thanks so much for um, spending the hour with us today. My name is Ying Tao. I head up digital products for Barclays, and I'm responsible for developing the digital strategy and in charge of identifying and integrating cutting edge technology into the firm to transform how we conduct business and how we interact with clients. Uh, we also partner very closely with our strategic investment team and uh, Barclays Ventures to invest in fintech companies. And I represent Barclays to sit on the boards of some of our portfolio companies. Outside of Barclays, uh, I also co-founded an education tech firm with two other fantastic women uh, six years ago. And we now attracted 300 million uh, Series C funding, which is a really um, interesting experience. But I. I uh, chose to stay in the corporate world and continue on my journey to transform this three-year-old bank. Uh, I also sit on the board of an industry organization called uh, Women in Derivatives. And our mission is to educate, attract, develop, uh, and retain female leaders in the financial space. We have programs such as Women on Boards and Women in FinTech and Women in Derivatives and et cetera. And we have monthly events and et cetera and partner with uh, Women in FinTech and other organizations to bring in um, fantastic events uh, for women in the industry. Well, to the audience, as promised, uh, incredible lineup of panelists here. So I think the hardest part of my job today is keeping this to an hour because we could probably spend the next five or six hours engaging in this discussion. So as a reminder, really, we're talking about diversity, inclusion, and equity. You know, these are day-to-day -day words we're now hearing, whether within our firms or publicly. And this is top of mind for all company leaders. But financial technology continues to evolve and women working in the workplace continues to evolve, yet there are still so few women in the workplace, particularly in the C-suite levels. So my first question I'm gonna address to, uh, to Katie and um, uh, Katie, Jen, and Sasha. Why is there such a disproportionate variance between the number of female-led startups that close funding rounds versus male-led startups? 
And the second part to that question is, do you see their problem in pattern in the language and reasoning behind female-led startups being denied funding? Uh, Katie, you want to um, start that, please? Sure. So, um, you know, something that we talk about at Anthemis is that admitting bias right out of the gate and talking about it uh, is just super important. And pattern matching is a real thing. And not just on, you know, what has been traditionally male funded companies, but happening, you know, I catch myself doing it. We have a lot of discussions around the investor table of are we falling into this? I think you know it can create a vicious cycle, right? Where I'm, I'm very hyper aware. Um, most recently, that the investors around the table can drive this cycle, right? And so, because the investors often in years past have looked a certain way, come from from similar backgrounds, this can affect the type of companies that um, are receiving capital. And then the cycle from that is these networks are created, right? So it's not just about capital, it's about networks as well, right? So networks among um, you know, similar people, right? Not picking up diverse networks and then not building um, wealth within these companies, right? There's also a, a, an equity gap in addition to a pay gap, right? Women receive less equity in startups than men, um, according to a study by, by Carta. Um, and so what happens then is then we need more diverse investors, right? Also driving capital to diverse founders. And when I say diverse, that just doesn't mean that, you know, demographics, um, gender. I'm also talking about backgrounds as well, right? Investors from corporate, investors that have startup experience, um, investors that have been operators, investors that are subject matter experts, right? And so if we can drive more um, equity, pay, wealth, to um, female founders, then we can also change how um, investment is being made as well, right? And those networks expand. Um, so, you know, admitting pattern matching happens on each side and then seeing how we can tap into address the investor ecosystem is something that I'm very focused on um, and excited about the opportunity. Thanks, Katie. Uh, Jen, do you wanna uh, give a response on, on your perspective on this? Sure, yeah, and Katie um, made a lot of fantastic points. Um, I think fundamentally, with fewer than 9% of venture capital check writers being women, I think that's, that's really the crux of the problem. So in, until we change who actually has the authority to invest, I don't know that we can make much progress. Um, fortunately, there are funds like Anthemis and others really dedicated to this, which is fantastic. But that, that seems to be fundamentally the, the core issue. Now, in terms of the sort of bias, what we hear from our founders every week, every day is, yeah, it's not just unconscious, unconscious it's actually conscious bias, um, which is a little bit eye-opening for me. I've never gone out and raised capital myself for a startup. Um, and so some of the um, feedback that we've heard is to know your audience and know when you're pitching that you are going to get the risk prevention questions. You're going to get risk mitigation questions, not the total addressable market question and how does this become a unicorn. So knowing that you, when you're out fundraising with a very homogenous group, that you're going to be um, subjected to more risk mitigation questions, prepare, but then try to pivot uh, back to what your vision is at the same time while you're addressing the risk mitigation. And then the other thing that we hear consistently, to Katie's point about network, our founders ask us for basically uh, three main things. Mentors, including male mentors, um, access and high level introductions, and then introductions to investors. And so if we can help them build their network, it, it creates that cycle, the positive cycle. 48% um, of female founders actually cite the lack of mentorship as one of the pediments to their success. So anything we can do to be inclusive, which we, we try to do with our program, so that we do have male mentors, that'll sort of integrate the network versus creating a siloed female-only network, which is my concern, too. I think we've got to combine forces versus um, creating a, a separate stream. Having said that, I am delighted to see how many female-led venture funds have um, launched in the last year, and I've heard a lot of others launching. So. Uh, more check writing by women, I think, will end up being a positive thing. 
Yeah, thanks, Jen. You know, um, one thing that you both said that really touched um, a memory for me is there's a female founder that I mentor, and I remember her telling me that, and it was her, she had had two successful exits. Her third company was in the retail space, and she had pitched to dozens of investors. And unfortunately, all these investors were men and couldn't understand what it was that she was trying to uh, to get funding for. And she said after about her like third dozen, um, three dozen meetings, she actually said to a group of investors, go home and talk to your partners, wives, you know, female friends, sisters, moms, and ask them what they think of this. And she said, you know, she was just so fed up with them all saying no, she actually voiced that and she did end up getting funding and she's doing quite well now. But it was just that, you know, sometimes when you're trying to get investment from, um, you know, a non-diverse kind of set of investors who don't may not necessarily be the recipients of what you're trying to build, that just makes it exponentially harder. Um, I'll turn that actually to uh, Sasha now. So Sasha, you've got New York City FinTech Women that you co-founded. You've got 6,000 plus members strong, myself included, as well as a lot of people on this call. I'm sure you've heard a lot of feedback and stories upon this. Um, your perspective on it? Yeah, so I agree with Jen. It's all about who you know. And I saw that firsthand in my role at Quovo and at Plaid, you know, where I was talking to CEOs multiple times a day that were starting their companies. And the way they were getting investment was they had relationships with these people and that then helped them going into the meeting because they had some kind of you know built up reputation as part of that and that's exactly why Michelle Tran and I started fintech women we wanted to create a network of women that can help each other and it's great to see that those results are coming through and there are also so many funds that are focusing on females too. So Anthemist, Backstage Capital, um, Shannon Austin at FinVenture Studios is amazing, really putting the focus on investing in female founders. So I think that there's a, you know, there's definitely a way to look at it negatively that there are only 3% of FinTech female founders that are VC backed, but it's also a really exciting opportunity. There's a lot of momentum in terms of focusing on female founders, and I think that we should jump on it. So I am excited. Thanks, Sasha. A question for Ying. Um, do you think that there's a lack of access to STEM programs at the root of the gender problem of women in fintech? I think the short answer is yes and no. Uh, what's really interesting is, uh, so I grew up um, with an uh, economics background, right? But I'm leading uh, digital transformation at a big bank at Barclays. During my tenure, I have always been questioned, whether it's internally or even when I go out for like informational interviews and et cetera, people are like, she doesn't have a tech degree. Will she be able to do the job? So I do think the bias exists, right? Whether it's un uh, unconscious or conscious bias which actually um, get in a way, right, for people to get really successful in their career. But on the other side, what I do think is Uh-oh, I think we might have lost Yang for a bit. Oh, sorry about that. It looks like a Ying screen just got the, uh, the dreaded uh, orange triangle, which means the connectivity has is, is lapsed. Um, Right. No, but we'll uh, we'll give Ying um, a couple of minutes to read, either from social media or from LinkedIn and etc. Individuals have so many opportunities to get educated without a degree. So I do think on the other side, uh, what I realize is just being myself, getting access right to uh, coding and programming or you know software development, bringing new perspective for me and help me to see see things right with new perspective. Uh, every aspects of my life. So from that perspective, I do think it's important for women uh, if they're interested in FinTech to try to get exposure for STEM, right? Whether through self-education or through some sort of formal program, but it's also not a showstopper if you don't. There are so many successful women out there. And I think the key is that you have to understand your value you know, and what you can do and also be aware of the potential gap and figure out how you can potential to, you know, close the gap. Thanks, Yang. And this is a question for anyone on the panel. Um, do, you, do stereotypical gender norms factor into the potential success of female-led startups? I 
can I can jump in here. Um, so, you know, an experience that I kind of still beat myself up about um, in going to to sell my company is I brought in um, as I knew we were entering acquisition. I brought in a male executive and a male investment banker to support um, myself and, and our team and our company in this acquisition. And I think one of the reasons is because I had the same gender stereotype for myself of that we need more men around the table because all of my conversations were with men. Um, so again, I mean, I think it's addressing it within ourselves first and our own confidence um, and then, you know, cliche, but leaning into that. So, I mean, I think it's just, again, recognizing that it does exist, but it also exists within ourselves and, and, and having the confidence to be able to say, yes, they do exist, but how are we going to um, kind of model and, and show that, that that stereotype is incorrect? Uh, just to add to that, I would just say that if you even look at where um, the venture capital money has gone in the early days in terms of female-led startups, it's fashion, beauty, wellness, fertility, retail. And so I thought, well, okay, that's great. Um, we're seeing some progress. But in 2017, when we were um, getting programs off the ground, we kept seeing only men apply to any innovation competition we ran. And we thought, well, if half the population are female, they make the vast majority of household buying decisions. They're more educated than ever. They're um, going to control uh, the biggest wealth transfer ever. Like, why are we not seeing female-led <laughs> fintechs and insurtechs? And, and sure enough, um, when we went out to launch our program, we went out to a bunch of banks and insurance companies, and they said, well, good luck. I mean, right, you're going to run this program, but you're not going to find any. Um, because for them, it was, well, women start companies in these categories, not in finance per se. And sure enough, um, we found over 70 terrific women-led fintechs and insurtechs. And so I think as more women are leading those sorts of companies, I think it'll inspire more female entrepreneurs to say, oh, well, you know what, I'm not that tech savvy, but I see that there's a, a personal um, um, savings uh, solution here that I should build. And I've seen, you know, hundreds of other women now go do that. So I've, hopefully we'll see that sort of uh, improve over time. And certainly in our community, we're seeing um, women help other women saying, well, when you go pitch, think about this and let me open some doors for you within financial services. And obviously this group here is a great example, right? We, we, we collaborate and we um, pass the baton forward, so to speak. So, um, so I'm, I'm optimistic, but yeah, we still have a lot of uh, more work to do to overcome the bias of, well, why aren't you running a baby startup or why aren't you, you know, running a fashion startup? It's like, well, a lot of senior to women at banks that are now leaving saying, I'm going to start my own company, right? So um, anyway, that's my thoughts. And I will chime in there very quickly. I think I agree with both Katie and Jennifer has said. Um, one thing uh, that's really interesting, I think Harvard has done a, a research a couple of years ago, and they ask small kids, right, kindergartners, to draw on a piece of paper what a leader looks like. And most of the kids draw with a, like a man figure. Because in their life, they see their dad going to work, right, be like a su successful leader. And then last year, I started to speak a lot, right, on social media and et cetera. And one day when I got home, my daughter, 10-year-old daughter said, mom, you're famous. I said, no, I'm not. But she's like, you are. I saw your videos on YouTube. That is so cool. And right, right off the bat, of that, I asked her, I said, does that make you think that you can achieve anything and do you want it to be famous when you grow up? And she said, yes, I wanted to be famous. I wanted to be on stage. I wanted to run my own company. And I think all of a sudden the mentality and the mindset shifted. And I think exactly to what Jennifer has said, role models in our society is really important. But I think it all starts from our own. Like, do you believe that you can achieve anything in your life that you wanted to achieve? Or do you let those obstacles get in the way and then constantly tell you, no, 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 you're not enough and you cannot achieve. And I think if you start from yourself and really start to change the narratives that are around you, you will soon find out that a lot of the things that magically shifted and then have the awareness to call out when biases 
to show up, right, and has the courage to really help, right, to say, no, I don't think this is right, right, and then providing, you know, support or evidence to uh, support your statements, and I think that's going to be very powerful and can go a long way. Yeah, I don't think I could have said it better than that. Um, you know, 20 years on Wall Street and I'm still surviving. I can't tell you how many times I've sat in a room and thought in my head, do I belong here? I, I don't think I belong here. Um, and you start doubting yourself. And I know there's that famous term imposter syndrome, but it is a lot of times in your head. And I personally, myself, I mean, I've been working at this for a long time. So I have to get over that. And remind yourself you're in there because you belong to you know you belong in that room you deserve to be in that room and you deserve to be heard and i think that's something you need to constantly remind yourself throughout your career so a great segue as you mentioned your daughter um there is a study by the harvard business review and i kind of you know cringe when i when i say this but it's quote women with children are viewed as less competent and less committed than women without children and men including fathers um, a pretty, pretty emotional statement for, for anyone who sees that or reads that. Um, I personally, a mom of two kids myself, and to your point, right, we can set an example where we can lead and, you know, the, the leadership figure isn't necessarily a man. It can be a man or a woman or both, right? Um, so the question here is, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll point this to, I'll start off with Katie. Do the fatherhood premium and motherhood penalty factor into success as a leader in the fintech space? They don't factor into the success, um, but they definitely come up to definitely to Merrick's point and to the study's point. I mean, I was pitching an investor um, once and, you know, abruptly in the middle of the pitch, I was asked, and what are your prior obligations? And I did not, I was like, I think I know what he's asking me, but I'm trying to think of other prior obligations. Uh, are we talking business? Am I committed to other businesses? So. You know, I think, um, again, with these female founder, female investor, female ecosystem networks are so important because one, like they do address the, um, as America said, the imposter syndrome, like again, calling it out, talking about it, having the discussions, was speaking with a colleague yesterday quickly um, and we talked about something regarding parenthood and, and motherhood in the midst of COVID and managing, you know, schooling and, and childcare and all of that. And just being able to like talk about that and, and say that, oh, it's a real thing, but we're doing it um, really kind of goes a long way um, in your day to day and, and not feeling that you have to cram that down or hide it. Um, I think also, you know, when there's, I, I'm, I have to be aware now that I'm working with just so many female founders and female investors that it's just like a given, like it's not a thing. Like we don't need to talk about like, oh, do you have kids? How's that like with running a business? Um, and I think that's the other, you know, that the media really likes to kind of talk about this more and more um, uh, around how, how are you doing it all? And it's, it's a great pitch and it's a great um, story, but... <laughs> I think we need to shift and really talk about how parents are doing it all, right? Not just um, not just mothers. Thanks, Katie. Uh, Jen, I'll turn that to you. Uh, fatherhood premium, motherhood penalty. What are your thoughts? I mean, I think what we hear from our founders um, as they're out trying to raise capital, those sorts of questions do come up. So it, it implies, are you committed to your business? Um, that, that we do hear that. The other piece is that even with an established FinTech or a financial services company, um, there's an issue with the fear of that woman going out on maternity leave and this like lack of continuity. And so one of the things that Deloitte shared with us was in their Center for Financial Services study was that, you know, there are about 3 million women that have left the workforce maybe to care for a child and now they're looking to reenter and there's no plan and there's no process and there's a real opportunity for forward thinking financial services companies and fintechs to really create a, a proper plan so that it's not um, a black mark that um, she maybe left for several months to um, parent her child and now she's ready to come back. So I think there's a real opportunity to actually create a positive path and say, you know, we're the company for you. And we're going to encourage you to raise a family, but you're also welcome to come back. And here's how we're going to reintegrate you 
if there's been a reorg or there's been a shift in and the priorities and in, in terms of the company itself. So I think that's an opportunity for big companies and small um, to kind of overcome that issue. Thanks, Jen. And uh, I have a question for all on this one, and I'll, I'll start with Sasha. What qualities, skills, and experience do top women in fintech possess, uh, which have allowed them to succeed in this space? The, the women that do well in the fintech space are results focused, get things done, they're able to manage many things at once, which are traits of just being. Also, I think that there are a, a lot of women that couldn't be executive level and to not be bias. So I've been fortunate enough institutions which actually unconscious training mandatory. It was amazing the result and the impact of women that are really good at their job being able to reach those positions that they're worthy of. Um, I think that there are some other factors that need to be embedded in organizations, such as taking a chance or women who may not necessarily have the experience because they haven't been given the opportunity due to their gender or being a minority. However, they do have the potential to be brilliant. And then finally, I think that the leaders of fintech companies need to be very um, willing to hire diverse teams in order for these brilliant women to actually show their full potential. Thanks, Sasha. Ying, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think I wanted to be very careful with the question because I think we might get into the stereotype again, right? What qualities will portray a successful leader? And I do think successful female leaders or male leaders come in different shapes, right? And, you know, experiences, right? Different backgrounds and et cetera. But I do think uh, as you um, know more of these leaders, I think there are some fundamental traits that could be really helpful. I think the first one is the ability to distinguish facts and interpretations, meaning that what are the things that are facts? For example, I'm, I need you know, 300 millions and et cetera. And the interpretation could be because I'm a woman, I'm being penalized where it's hard for me to get funding, right? I think some aspects of that could be facts, right? But some of the facts could just be interpretation. And most of the times get people in the way in really getting what they wanted. And I think the next thing that really stands out as a successful founder or successful person in any aspects that they do is they make decisions or they create opportunities based on their wants and desire, not based on fears and the survival mechanisms, right? It's not to prove that I'm worse than more than what I do. It's people who feel comfortable of who they are and who declare this is what I want and then take actions to really make that happen. I think those two things are in almost every founder that I encountered, or even when I invest as a, an angel investor or just from you know strategic investment perspective, you look for the qualities in the very strong founding team. And I also wanted to add the fact that I think being a parent, whether it's mom or dad, probably more mom, that actually make you a better founder. Because if you can explain your business idea to a six-year-old, you probably will have a better chance to succeed to explain that to most of your users or, or you know, investors. And if you can solve the conflicts of two children constantly fighting your love, your attention, and a, a, a lot of small things, you are probably better prepared to manage a team, right? And to solve the conflicts that may even happen at the Trump, not Trump, like at the board level <laughs> or like the presidential campaign level. <laughs> I think, you know, women should take those as gifts rather than burdens, right, to help them achieve whatever they wanted to achieve in their career or life. You're here. The secret to getting funding is getting a six-year-old to understand your pitch. <laughs> exactly. I don't think I've actually heard that one before, so I think we're going we're gonna to use that for uh, going forward. Um, Jen, you mentioned to me yesterday, um, you know, having some, um, some founder stories that you thought um, may be worth sharing. Um, do you want to touch on that a bit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we 
we've seen so many remarkable women launch businesses in financial services from uh, lending to saving to um, gamified saving for millennial parents with goal setter um, to UNEF, who is helping folks understand how to save for the college savings 529 account. And, uh, you know, just to name a few examples, um, remarkable company Alloy in New York. Edwina Johnson is a senior leader there. She just closed a, a major round. They're doing really interesting things in finance. UNEST raised uh, 9 million Series A, the college savings app. Um, and she publicly shared her story of fundraising. That's worth a read. Um, recommend that. Um, very um, apropos here. Um, uh, a terrific entrepreneur, um, Megan, who runs Oval um, in Kenya, has done a terrific job of moving money and getting money in the hands of small businesses um, in emerging markets. And then just one more highlight, um, Stratify, um, an amazing uh, entrepreneur, Laura Kornhauser, who is removing bias from AI, which is the fundamental underpinning of claims, uh, uh, policy underwriting or credit risk scoring. So she's really uncovering some remarkable capabilities with uh, machine learning. And she uh, has been on all sorts of lists and is a real um, in inspiration. And what's been great to see is that each program that we've run, one entrepreneur has referred the other um, to join. Don't be afraid, apply to this program. And, and they start opening doors for one another and giving each other speaking opportunities. So it's just been really terrific. And, and we too, we love to tell our founders, okay, you know, great that you participated in our program, but, you know, go to Anthemis, go to Rise, go to these, you know, go to these programs, get more support because it's all about um, education, mentorship, and inspiration, I think, along the way through different lenses of each of our communities and programs and, and join, you know, New York FinTech community. So, um, I, I'm, I'm watching with a close eye because we've been running this, uh, our program since 2017. I think on the negative note, um, they're really not raising capital uh, to the degree that they should. And so it's really, I just, I, it, it's, um, it's frustrating, but then I see that they are resilient and they just, they keep moving forward and get creative with small business loans, friends and family, crowdfunding, and really try to find alternate sources of funding to keep the lights on and keep growing and scaling. So I'm um, happy to share more examples. And if anyone wants to reach out, I can send um, a list of all great companies to look at. Thank you, Jen. Uh, Katie, this is an exciting month for us. It marks the one-year anniversary of the launch of the females, fem Female Innovators uh, Lab by uh, Bar between Barclays and Anthemis. Um, can you talk a little bit about the program and how are programs like this looking to address the gender diversity gap in the industry and truly help women entrepreneurs and founders in the early stages of their business? Sure. Yeah. So Female Innovators Lab um, investment fund, um, investing significant check sizes um, and also a venture studio lab providing very customized support for the founders as they're getting their business off of the ground. Um, and so, you know, when you're when you're starting your business as a founder in early stage, I mean, you, you would love to have, you know, a COO, a CMO, a CFO, a chief compliance officer, right? All of these roles to, to kind of set you up for success. But obviously, you know, resources and funding and time and energy, not always, um, you know, feasible. And also, it's like your business ebbs and flows, and you may need different resources, especially in the beginning as you're figuring out product market fit, you're figuring out um, kind of the team build out. And so in addition to that capital, you know, the Venture Studio not only can provide those resources, customize at times, depending on what the business needs, right? So it's not something where you go through, um, you know, a set program that starts at this date, and then you work um, you know, to the end of, of a certain date. It's really customized to what the founder needs, hands-on support. And the other very, very crucial portion of this is that, you know, as we're solving this funding gap, you know, we've talked about this, everyone has touched upon this of, you know, it just can't be, um, you know, capital, it has to be partnerships, it has to be mentorships. But a fundamental part of um, the Female Innovators Lab is, is the partnership and the access to the Barclays ecosystem as well, right? When you're building fintech, um, you know, navigating, um, you know, financial institutions, 
um, financial service companies um, is is difficult at times. And you know, if there's a, a way or a path or a concierge or or someone that can help navigate that for you, um, I think that's a huge value add. And even if it's not like directly aligned to what you may be doing, again, those networks within, you know, Barclays, within, you know, our venture community and ecosystem, we believe, um, and as everyone said in this panel, are very, very instrumental in addition to funding. I didn't meet my first female technology founder until I was 29 years old. Um, so when I started my business, you know, if I need an accountant, I was interviewing accountants, right? I ran into a situation where, oh my goodness, this is a huge problem with a client. I really didn't have the network and the beginning to pick up the phone and say, hey, and to, you know, to even have kind of that vulnerability with someone that maybe has gone through that. So, you know, there are those components as well that we're looking to build. Um, and, you know, if all of those things are set up, we give the business a, another jump start in addition to the funding. Um, and so, you know, again, encourage um, if you know female founders, pre seed, early stage, um, you know, in addition, Anthem is, uh, invests across um, a variety of stages and all types of founders. Um, but, you know, kind of spread the word to everyone's point of, you know, connecting people, even if it may not be a fit for your fund or um, your program of being aware of different resources to connect founders to is just is just crucial um, in, in bridging this gap. And just to um, piggyback off that, Katie, um, you know, you mentioned how these networks can be so powerful at helping potential fintech female founders. And I just wanted to call out that NYC Fintech Women is definitely there to support as well. So we do have a partnership with Dwayne Morris, the law firm. They do pro bono hours for NYC Fintech Women members who may be interested in exploring whether their idea could eventuate into an actual company. Um, we have a ton of other female founders that can help too. So Melissa Kosh from a compliance perspective, we have um, Liang Zhao from a marketing PR perspective. So there's a ton of very talented women out there that can help other women achieve um, these goals of becoming their own FinTech founder. That's great. I think we've all agreed, right? Mentoring is is key and, and those connections, um, I guess for those of you who don't know as well, but I think most of the folks who are on this panel and a lot of the folks I see who've joined have been involved. Arise also hosts something called FinTech Fridays, where we actually offer mentoring with a wide array of experts um, in various parts of the industry to actually meet with interested parties. It's it's sort of like a, a quick mentoring um, you know, session, and it gives you just a chance to talk to people you may not otherwise get access to and get very valuable, useful advice. Um, and, it, and it works both ways. Everybody who participates in it as a mentor gets so much out of it. Um, they don't, you know, they do this because they want to. So please do take advantage of that. There are a lot of resources there, whether it's Rise, New York City FinTech Women, or just a large variety of uh, companies and investors and mentors who are out there willing to give their time. Take advantage of that. Um, I wanted to switch upon something that was uh, talked about a lot in the media for a bit. Uh, this I'll address to Ying. Um, there was a memo that was issued by Google. Um, it was called Google's Ideological Echo Chamber. It was a memo that was made public and it caused quite a stir. And, and there was um, a lot of the, the claims and, and the language used in the memo evoked some you know, particular um, responses um, from folks across the board. Yang, I wanted to see that um, one, if you can give a quick overview of what that memo was about in case folks um, in, in this call were, aren't familiar with it as well as did it evoke any particular memories or experiences that you may have had during your career in fintech? Yeah, so the MIMO was about, uh, there was an engineer in Google, right? So he uh, felt the urge to really talk about gender diversities and et cetera. And I think he was trying to provide a lot of evidence right, and facts to say, one is women probably not made right for like engineering roles, right? And two is women probably more, um, easier to get stressful, right, which probably not meant uh, for those like looks of roles, whether it's in investment bank or in um, tech, right, or some of the other comments that he made. I think when I read it, after being on Wall Street for almost 20 years, I sort of felt like I can finally make me make peace of some of those comments. 
I think it's great that you know someone is willing to bring it up and talk about very openly. I think that really creates an opportunity for kind of debates, right? And then that's where you can really differentiate what are the facts and what are the personal opinions or potential biases. But I think what's really interesting is we talked about equality, right? And we use the word a lot as 50-50. We said, you know, we think there should be 50% of female founders. But my personal view is 50 might not be a tangible role or goal that we wanted to achieve because the reality could be there should be 70% of the female founders, right? Or 49%. 50, I think it's really the idea of equality, meaning that we wanted to, we know the current status is not right. And we have to provide the environment, right? The um, network, the resources to encourage and support women to get over and then to be the one that they really wanted to be. I think some of the comments has made around, you know, women are tend to be stressful. And I apparently I don't think that is true. Right now, evidenced by COVID, right, there is a lot of parents are stuck at home with their kids. And you can clearly see that the mom probably usually are the calmer ones and the dads are probably <laughs> bring a lot of awareness to what they can tolerate and what the life of a mom should look like. I think things like that actually helps, you know, the other side of the gender to really understand what's uh, going on, right? So what might be their interpretation versus what the facts could be. So I think overall, I do think uh, debates like this could be really helpful. And the more people are joined to make comments, right, and then really examine some of those statements makes it you know, easier for we all talk about it and hopefully can come with some um, actions right, that really helps to bridge the gender gap. Thanks, Yang. Well said. Um, right now, women account for less than 5% of executive positions in fintech, yet women control about 70% of household finances throughout the world. Um, now, this is a question I'm gonna open to all our panelists. Uh, cities have shown that gender disparity within fintech does not only apply to the lack of women in executive roles, which we all know is lacking, but also a lack of female users of fintech products. How can self-identifying male fintech leaders act to be more inclusive, not only in their hiring practices, but also in their product development and marketing? Yeah, I can, um, I'll, I'll jump in first if you want. Um, so I think a, a few things. Um, First of all, I think market research and understanding who your audience is and gathering feedback and listening versus crafting a product that's uh, backed by an entire group of male uh, product leaders um, is not really going to address the needs of the female marketplace. In financial services, what's interesting is that the, the feedback that women have provided is um, you know, I want to know more. I need to ask questions. I want to know that there is support if I have an issue with the product. Um, I take peer recommendations very, um, um, very, take them very highly. And they, from a financial services um, management perspective, tend to be a little bit um, uh, risk averse and more cautious. Um, with um, spending, but also um, participating in the market. And so if you're a founder of a fintech, well, you better start to hire uh, diverse team members and, and study um, what is half of their market and a very um, lucrative growth um, aspect of the market. So I think that um, uh, having diversity of board advisors and staff and taking in that feedback all it comes into play. And interestingly, one anecdote that I think um, you'll appreciate, I met a, a startup because of your mentor program, the, the FinTech Fridays, and it was a group of guys, all guys running a, a wealth tech startup, but they thought very carefully about who their audience is. And it's going to be a lot of um, untapped uh, audience, um, women um, with a lot of wealth to manage. And so um, they thought very carefully about their board of advisors and said they want at least 50% of the women, women as advisors, so they could start to get difference of opinion, start to understand what pain points um, someone like me might have in, in managing my own money. So I thought it was really interesting that they were, they proactively took that approach. Um, and then lastly, I would just say that um, 
I think providing public uh, support of women within fintechs is also really important. So even if the CEO is a man, you know, take the time to highlight, encourage your women uh, on your team to speak on panels to represent the company, because if not, it's just that negative cycle of, well, we're just going to keep designing products for ourselves and then miss half the market. It's not very practical. Thanks, Jen. I think Sasha had wanted to respond as well. Um, I was just going to give the example that I thought was awesome, which was actually an Anthemus portfolio company, Rally. Um, they actually raised $17 million, the announcement was today. Um, but they allow you to buy a small share in a vintage car, and then they IPO that asset, and um, you can own a part of it. Um, they were very much focused on mail assets like cars etc um, they asked to do a fintech women event to get some women to be their customers and it was a really fun successful event um, during that event we were asking when are you going to start to ipo handbags and you know female focused items and they've done it now so i think like that's a really smart pivot of them because you know if it's just cars you're essentially eliminating a huge potential market so i think that was great the other the other topic that has come up a lot lately is the fact that a lot I think something like ninety five percent of like cryptocurrency owners are male, and so you start to think about like well that's the next wave that are women going to miss out on that financial product as well whether you believe in it or not and um, and I think it does come back to that knowledge sharing that that peer recommendation so even in a marketplace. Women trust other women's uh, advice, uh, especially around uh, around money. So I just think that's another example where we've got to kind of break that that cycle. It it shouldn't be all <laughs> owned by men. It's it's, it's a strange um, statistic. We don't have an exact number, I don't think, but it's something very very high. Um, so I don't know if anyone else thought uh, that was uh, an example of what might need to be fixed, but pretty compelling. Uh, another conversation that we often have with founders and actually very early on is about the diversity of the team. And again, it's not just about checking boxes and, you know, are you thinking about these things? But we have conversations to to everyone's point here who was just speaking on this um, around how that affects your product development, your sales, your roadmap, things like that, of that those diverse opinions. Right. You know, kind of to Sasha's point, um, you know, they they needed to hear that feedback. Um, and if you're in an echo chamber where there's, again, the same type of people, you're, you're not going to get those responses. Um, and so, you know, we, we even have a talent lead in house who not only helps with recruiting talent, but also have those conversations and really also study the effects of that and, and how they're thinking of the, their go to market around that as well. Um, so it, it, it's interesting to see how that evolves and, um, love, love hearing, um, the, the, the rally road story. I want, I want to get in on the handbag. I didn't even really know that uh, I'm the first to admit it. So, um, yes, yeah, sign me up for shares and handbags. Don't forget my invite as well. <laughs> Well, uh, we're at the five minute mark. So uh, I know this hour has flown by tremendously. And like I said, we could probably keep on talking for another five or six hours, but unfortunately uh, we, we are running out of time. Um, I'd like to close it with just letting each panelist, uh, you know, give their little bits of how they want to, you know, sort of leave this. And if there's anything you want this audience to remember or think about. For me, um, I think two things really. Um, your network is so important and make sure that they're meaningful connections. You know, having a casual hello with someone and connecting with them on LinkedIn is not what I'm talking about. It's having those meaningful connections so that you can actually learn from each other. And hey, if there's an opportunity in the future to work together or collaborate, great. But regardless, that mentoring and connectivity you have is gonna be key in your success. And then really, as I mentioned before, uh, I think you're gonna find yourselves very often being the only woman in the room get it out of your head that you don't belong there. Because if you're in that room, you do belong there. And the biggest change I've made mentally for myself is I used to get very, um, I would say, again, it was all internal. I never expressed this publicly, but I, I'd get a little intimidated if I was the only woman in the room because I would feel like everybody would judge what I had to say. But I don't know, a few years ago, I really flipped that mindset. And I thought, well, if I'm the only woman in the room and there's 20 men in here, guess what? They're going to listen to me. 
and they're going to have to hear what I have to say because, um, you know, because uh, I'm there for a reason and I'm going to give that diversity of thought and just make sure that, you know, you have that confidence. And a lot of it, again, is sometimes in your head, just get out of it and, you know, present what it is you have to say and you're there for a reason and you belong there. Um, all right. With that, I'll turn it to, to the group, um, you know, kind of uh, your parting words. I'm sure, there's a lot of, I'm sure there's a lot of founders um, on the call. Um, and I, I know, again, we keep talking about um, networking, um, but, um, you know, kind of two things around that of, you know, a lot, I talk to a lot of founders and, you know, it's a lot about like networking up, right? I want to, I want to talk to the president of this organization. I want to talk to the CEO or, of this organization. And, you know, I would also say to make sure you're thinking of networking down. Um, I mean, you're building teams. Th this is the future of who will be founding companies doing amazing things. So being diverse in kind of the, the seniority and the level of your networking, you know, th they may be making sales decisions later. But also, again, you know, you're affecting the ecosystem and change by having different um, levels of conversation. Um, you know, my intern I hired is now COO of um, a technology company in Silicon Valley. Right. And now I'm asking her for for advice on certain things as well. So really kind of tapping into not just kind of uh, diversity in, um, you know, kind of um, demographic of, of networks, but also seniority um, as well. And um, I'll just add a little bit to that. So I think that there's so much power in give and get. So don't just, you know, reach out to someone and ask for help, but think creatively about how you can help them. You know, everyone is connected by six degrees of separation. So even if on initial look at it, it doesn't look like you have some kind of value you can add, chances are that you do, or chances are that a five minute conversation, it will be drawn out. So I just really encourage that, collaboration between women and male allies, and I think it will make a huge difference. Yeah, I guess um, those are all terrific points. I would just add to what uh, something that Ying said, which is know your value. Um, we recently had a, an inspiring woman address our group, and she put it very succinctly, know what your I am is, and don't be afraid to to stand for what you believe in, but then also ask for what you need. And I thought those were really important points. So I think uh, that, that hopefully will resonate with others. Perfect, thank you, Jennifer. I think for me, my two cents will be, the first one is um, fear will always be around us right throughout our career. So fear the fear and do it anyway. I think the question is, um, we just have to not be scared of the unknown because most of the times the opportunities sits in the unknown and not sits in your comfort zone, right? So feel comfortable of challenging your comfort zone one day at a time. What I find is really inspiring and helpful, especially for female lead, uh, founders. And I think the second thing, uh, similar to what Katie has said, I think it's really uh, women helping women or women helping everyone, right? In the sense that when you see people in need, right? When you see someone who may need an introduction to, you know, a VC and you happen to be the one who knows, just very quickly, you know, make the introduction. And then more and more people in the circle, you will realize the network effect, right? And there will be one plus one greater than uh, two. Well, thank you, Yang. Thank you, Sasha, Jen, Katie. Uh, really great discussion. I appreciate your time. And thank you for everybody who joined us today. Um, please look out for future events. Uh, I think this is you know, just one of, of many that we'll be hosting as, as this topic evolves. And I appreciate everybody spending an hour with us today.